Thank you, everybody. Um, so yeah, as Ruth mentioned, I'm Serena. I've been a volunteer at the hatchery um, since 2016. Um, started my career here, uh, made all of the connections, love fish, um, and started off working with DFO and then moved um, over to working full-time at a consulting firm with Bailey Environmental Consulting. Um, so that's a little bit of my background and I've been working in consulting since it has been five years now. It's crazy. Um, my name's Camille. Pretty similar journey, honestly. Um, started out here um, and then, uh, yeah, worked for the Pacific Salmon Commission, worked for DFO for a little bit, um, just doing stock assessment. Um, then I started getting into more consulting work because that is more steady work and a bit more pay. And then I got hired by Bailey Environmental Consulting and now I'm essentially the wildlife lead slash biologist for Bailey. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's a little bit of our background. So just so today we're going to be talking about Oregon Forest Snail and Pacific Water Shrew. So um, back in 2021, um, we put in a proposal with the Habitat Stewardship Program, um, which is a, a branch of uh, Environment Climate Change Canada. And we won a proposal to do work with Oregon Forest Snail and Water Shrew. So that was really, really cool. Um, so some of our partners that worked on the project with us was AEW, um, Bailey Environmental, obviously, and then uh, J. Hobbs Ecological Consulting. And we also got a secondary uh, amount of funding from um, the Center for Indigenous Environmental Resources, and that was provided in, in 2022. So just um, I'm operating two different systems here, so... <laughs> Bear with me. Um, so, so th these are some of the acknowledgements for all the people who worked on the project. So we had Jess Finley also, he did a lot of the photography on the project. He also did a lot of the camera setup um, for the shrew stuff. And yeah, I think I talked about everybody else already. So yeah, so the Habitat Stewardship Program, it was established in 2000. And it focuses to provide funding for projects submitted by Canadians that contribute directly to the recovery objectives and population goals of species at risk listed under Schedule 1 of the Species at Risk Act and that prevent others from becoming a conservation concern. So essentially their big focus um, or one of the requirements for getting um, funding for them is that we could not do a research-based project. So what we did is we evaluated um, the model that was provided to us by ECCC and they were looking at um, essentially categorizing uh, uh, Oregon forest snail habitat as high moderate, high moderate or low and um, our job was to go out and test it to see how great their model was. So in 2020-2021 we performed our field surveys to test the proposed government habitat suitability model for Oregon forest snail. Um, we also wanted to expand the known occurrences for OFS. And um, we also did a trial, uh, or we trialed a novel eDNA baited pass through tube detection method for Pacific water shrew. And then in 2022, we went out and we further wanted to expand their known occurrences. And then we also increased testing effort for the past uh, pass through detection tubes for Pacific water shrew. Uh -huh. And we'll get into the water shrew stuff a little bit later, just so you guys know. So yeah, so we're just gonna go over a little bit of a species overview for Oregon forest snail. So these guys are gastropods. Um, their average size is about 28 to 35 millimeters. They're a light amber or reddish brown color, and they do uh, bleach um, as they get older, so this guy's a little bit bleached out. And they have these distinctive yellow striations that occur um, along their shell. They have about 5.25 uh, to 6 whorls at each shell, and I think Camille just uh, sent out a little shell for every everyone to see. But their main distinctive fe feature is this um, white uh, aperture that they have um, at their shell opening. So this is their species range um, in Canada. Uh, they do go down to the US. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so they go as far as uh, Hope and um, 
and around West Vancouver here. There also is another population in Crofton, BC, which is on Vancouver Island, and there's only been one population identified on the island so far. They're native to this area? Yeah, yes. yeah, this is their native range. And on the island, is that native there too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So conservation status, these guys are endangered under Schedule 1 of the Species at Risk Act, and they're also red listed in BC. Um, this is why we were able to do the work, because HSP focuses on Sarah listed species. So this is a little bit about their life cycle. Um, so in the spring, um, they, so essentially they like to, they like to uh, lay their eggs near um, forest edges. Um, and this is basically because there's a lot of uh, food resources near the, e near the e uh, forest edges because that's where a lot of um, sting nettle grows and that's their primary food source. So they have a 63 day um, incubation. Then they hatch in, in, in the late summer, early, or in the early summer, or sorry, in the late spring, early summer, they hatch. Um, and then they become juveniles, and then in the winter and fall and winter, essentially at the first frost is when they decide to hibernate. Um, and then at that point in the following year, then they'll be ready to mate. And these guys can live up to eight years long, so which is pretty impressive for a little snail. <laughs> So this are is they, their, oh, are okay. they considered insects or bugs or? They're gastropods, gastropods. yeah, so invertebrates would be like a good, yeah. yeah. Um, so these guys' preferred habitat is um, old growth big leaf maple, as you can see from this photo. Um, lots of coarse woody debris, so lots of downed logs, um, and uh, a varied understory vegetation. So what we've found in the field, what we found in the field was that they really like um, dense passage, patches of elderberry and uh, stinging nettle mixed together. Um, they're also historically known to be at between 30 to 360 meters above sea level. You see the stars here, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> um, they prefer west aspect slopes, uh, valley depressions, gorges, anywhere that has like a, a high moisture content. And um, their main food source is anything that's high in calcium, so this would be stinging nettle. This is what they prefer to eat. Um, yeah, yeah, and they use calcium, Camille just mentioned, Camille, they use uh, calcium carbonate um, to uh, create their shells. That's why they prefer the high calcium content in their diet. Okay, and Camille will talk about our uh, survey design. Sorry, what did you say they eat? Oh, they eat uh, uh, vegetation that's high in calcium because they use that calcium to build their shells and their shells are made out of calcium carbonate. So that's why they're focused on it. So, so natively, um, stinging nettle seems to be one of the highest, uh, has the highest concentration of calcium, and then second to that is elderberry, so that's probably why they're, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll go into a bit of the, the survey design, how we, how we actually figured out where to go look for these snails, essentially. So this is our final result I'm putting in first, because it kind of looks like a mess if you just get this initially. <laughs> so you can tell it's quite hard to, to, to see what's on this map. Um, but I'll sort of go into how we developed it and how we chose our survey areas in a second. Um, so essentially what we started with is obviously the known range of OFS. So um, that's this slide right here. Um, this is available, uh, this was given to us by uh, uh, the Conservation Data Center. And it's a good starting point because obviously we need to know where the animal is. Um, the second thing that, that we go after that is we go, okay, where have they been located before? So that's the slide up here. And so we got um, data from publicly available sources like iNaturalist, um, and then we requested data from the Conservation Data Center, and also any historic uh, 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 detections um, that were just available to the government. Um, so we put that on this layer, or sorry, on top of the range layer. Yeah, why doesn't it go um, yes, <laughs> as far as uh, I, I, in order to fit the images, I, I had to cut them. I'm trying to figure out where for our images, but it would be beyond. Yeah, yeah, it would be over here. So, okay. yeah, just to get the images <laughs> condensed. So, I think Mossman Creek is right here. Oh, it is, okay. Yeah. Great. Um, then the next step was 
obviously we can't trespass pass on people's land. So what we did is we got a publicly available um, a private land layer and we overlaid that on top of our existing layers. And then all of these blue little lines you see in here are water courses found in BC. These snails prefer areas that are quite wet, so naturally it's a good idea for us to look in these kind of depressions. Um, and then last but not least, um, I can't actually really show a zoomed in area because, uh, or a zoomed in portion of this map. Um, we got a habitat suitability model that was developed by Environment Climate Change Canada, and they gave that to us to help us also locate these snails and to try and stress test um, um, uh, their model. So yeah, essentially, that this, all of that information becomes this crazy looking layer, which not easy to read. So what we did after that is we sort of just, before we went out into the field, we would zoom into different areas, and this is Mossel Creek Hatchery, and we looked for areas and mapped them out of what's easily accessible, um, not, or that's on crown land um, that is in those um, uh, habitat suitability, uh, in our habitat suitability model, and that's within their critical habitat. So I don't have two of those layers on here because I'm not allowed showing them, unfortunately. But if you can imagine, um, there's a whole there would be a whole bunch of colored polygons um, that would show either high suitable habitat, moderate suitable habitat, or low suitable habitat. And so we chose areas where they were labeled as high. <clears throat> and once we had that, we would obviously go into the field and we would map um, everywhere that we would go, um, essentially with handheld GPSs. So this is sort of what it looks like after the fact, after we've looked in an area. This is Sumas Mountain, one of the highest densities of um, OFS that we found. And um, every OFS that we would find, which you'll, I, I'll show later, um, we would put a point on the map, naturally, and then that would give us a very good idea and data to help uh, uh, send later to um, uh, Environment Climate Change Canada. Um, our trans so our transects were essentially sort of broken up into 0.8 hectare pentagons, which again I can't show you, which is unfortunate. And those pentagons were once again labeled as either high, moderate, or low suitability, and that's the government model. Um, when we got in the field and we were doing these meander transects, we also assessed the habitat, which is an important component of this project. Um, so we would we would assess things like canopy cover. Um, how much big leaf maple there is, how much vegetation, how much coarse woody debris. Um, and we would compare that to the, the suitability model and just essentially compare our ratings to their ratings. Um, obviously, what is a meander transect, in case you guys don't know? So a meander transect is kind of what it sounds like. You sort of walk through an, a, your survey area and try and find the best um, best habitat or suitable habitat. Um, so it involves a lot of, uh, obviously a lot of hiking through um, forested areas like this. Here we're on a, the side of a hill um, pointing to some big leaf maple or, you know, some nice hiking trails that we got to go on a, a couple of times. And we are, again, essentially looking for things like elderberry, um, lots of uh, big leaf maple, um, and definitely tons and tons of stinging nettle, which my god, so much singing metal. Uh, it, was, it was ridiculous. I, I wish I had a photo, but there was a photo where I didn't put on um, long sleeve shirt, a long sleeve shirt, because it was uh, really hot, which is really stupid of me. Um, and uh, my arms came away. It looked like I was going through anaphylactic shock or something. Um, yeah, so obviously finding OFS isn't easy. Here's, a, here's one that was found in the field underneath a whole bunch of uh, sword fern. So you can see it's quite small. Obviously, you know, um, eventually you get you sort of get an eye for it, but they're not easy to find. Every so often you find them, are, we called it arboreal, um, where they're crawling up ferns or stinging nettle. But oftentimes you can see here's Serena face first in stinging nettle. Um, and yeah, so this is, this is typically what it looked like when we found a good site. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to find them after rainfall. Um, during periods of drought, they, they tend to um, estivate, which is essentially they, they put this mucus uh, layer over top of their opening, um, which dries out and that helps them retain moisture. But once it rains, um, they break that layer and then they start going out and about. This guy, I think we scared him when he went back in, but. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so year one, um, here's another example, or, uh, no sorry, this is the same image, but um, so yeah, our year one was focused on stress testing the model that we got for from Environment Climate Change Canada. And so we were searching in areas um, within the, the model that they gave us, outside of the model. So we were essentially just trying everything we possibly can to try and break this model of theirs to see how good it is. Um, for year two, um, we decided that um, we got all the information we needed about the, the model. And so uh, we decided to just find as many occurrence locations of these snails that we possibly can to, to, in the hopes that in the future, those areas can be protected on Crown Land. Um, yeah, so once again, so these are essentially our four main native snails. There's a couple other ones, but um, this is our nice OFS. Um, it's pretty good, not, not, it's not representative of their sizes, so these guys are quite a bit smaller, and these guys are also quite small. Like, we're talking like about this big. Ooh, yeah. yeah, quite small. So, um, yes, yeah, so this is our Oregon forest snail. This is our Pacific land, uh, or sorry, a Pacific sideband. This is a Northwestern Hesperian, and this is a uh, land student species. Um, and yeah, so once again, if we found a snail, we would essentially um, assess the habitat, um, we would record their U2EM coordinates for every live and dead snail that there were. Um, we would record the distances that we traveled and how long we traveled for with how many people, which helped us calculate our survey effort, which we'll get into later. And we also recorded any kind of gastropods that we found and any incidental species. Here's some of those incidental species. Okay, so this is some of the faint things that we found because when you're really close to the ground, you actually see a lot, surprisingly. <laughs> so this is the Pacific tree frog that we found. Um, <laughs> Zach, who's a, he's a um, fish biologist with UBC. Um, he joins us out on cool projects every so once in a while. Um, he's got a uh, red-backed salamander there, and there's a northwestern salamander here, and you got your red tail there. And then we got a little squirrel guy. <laughs> this is um, actually really neat. So this is actually called a hair's foot in cap, and they only last about a few hours. So we were really lucky that we actually got to see this guy at all. Um, yeah, it's really neat. Yeah. Um, this is a western toad, and then here we've got a long toad salamander. We actually found all of the salamander species in the lower mainland while we were um, doing our surveys, which is pretty cool. And some exciting finds we found. So this is a unofficially, this is what we're calling it, it's bad biology, leucistic Pacific sideband. Um, we couldn't find any documentation to, um, to describe why these two guys are same species, but why there's such a different color variation. And it was only in one spot. It was uh, near Teapot Trail. Um, that we found this distinctive yellow color in Pacific sidebands. Usually we, um, we don't see that at all. So more to find out about this one. It's pretty interesting. Um, this is a giant coastal salamander, super, Pacific sorry, Pacific giant salamander. These guys are super rare. Um, so we found one of these, which was super exciting. How big would that be? Um, they, well, the adults get to like this big. Yeah, yeah. yeah. adults um, I think to 30 centimeters, and this, yeah. this was a juvenile, was which was... Here, yeah. this big, yeah. Is that on the Stimass Mountain? No. No. The, this was, uh... Because they are up there, right? That's the only... Uh, out the valley, they're not around here. Yeah, no, it, was it, it wasn't It was in Chilliwack. Yeah. It was in Chilliwack. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a little... I know we're on the map, but it's not the name. Yeah, we can follow up with that one later. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And the, and the snake? Oh, just uh, this is a garter snake that we found. <laughs> we think common? Yeah, we think in common. It's a gar think common garter. Um, okay, so this is how we rated our uh, density of our uh, some of the key biophysical attributes that we did. So um, we used the diff scoring, um, which is essentially, a, it's called describing ecosystems in the field. This is just a way of rating what the density of whatever you're trying to measure um, is. So, um, and also not to confuse things, um, we'll get into this a little bit later, but five is, uh, is considered to be nothing, and zero is considered, considered to be high density. So our models 
the values flipped because we like to complicate things. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so anyways, we looked at the density of big leaf maple, um, OFS density, um, forge quality, um, which we considered both nettle and elderberry, and then um, understory vegetation density as well. And uh, the higher density for um, these attributes, the more likely we were going to uh, more likely we were going to find OFS, and so therefore we would give it a higher uh, rating. So we did scores for canopy cover. So these are just some examples of what we would consi be considered to be low, moderate, and high. So you can see on the far right photo, we've got a uh, fairly open canopy. Um, and then on the, on the far left, we've got a very dense canopy cover. And um, the scoring that we uh, used for these is, uh, it varies. So, and it, we, it varies based on what we read in the recovery strategies, as well as we, what we know for the biology for these snails. So for example, diet, we would rate, we would give it a higher high quality score because if there's no food, there's gonna be no snails. So here, so forage quality, so there we go. We've got a high quality score of 40 here. Um, so for forage quality, if, if we had um, uh, no elderberry and no stinging nettle or a disc score of zero, we would rate that as like a five or a low quality. And then if we had dense patches of continuous cover of stinging nettle, elderberry, and if there was also ferns present, we would rate it as a um, 40. We also looked at things like soil quality. So if the leaf litter was um, fairly sparse and we had um, really like um, friable soil, we would rate that as low. And then if we had something that had like really deep, uh, really uh, deep organic layer, then we would rate that as a high quality for soil. And then for understory vegetation, we also, so dense patches of shrub or continuous shrub layer under story cover, we would consider that to be very, very high. And, and you can see the photo on the right, I think I'm looking at my phone here. <laughs> um, there's just almost no understory cover, it's very sparse. We've got a little bit of ferns everywhere, but on, on, on average, fairly, fairly sparse. Might not look it from the photos, but yeah. you gotta trust this. <laughs> And then coarse woody debris is another one. So, so course, they use coarse woody debris to hibernate. So this is an important for their uh, life cycle. So uh, we evaluated that as well. Um, so high coarse woody debris, we get a higher score. Low coarse woody debris, low score. And then from all of that data, we would tabulate it all into our um, data sheet and we would come out with a number. And so if our number was between 165 we would rate that as a high quality. If our number was between 64 and 30, it would be moderate, and between 29 and 11, low, and then 10 to zero is unsuitable. Um, so we put all that together. We then were able to determine if the area we surveyed was high, moderate, or low, based on what we saw in the field, and then compared that to the model that um, ECC provided us. So what did we find? So snail distribution and abundance is positively associated with several key aspects. There's many different things that we found. So high density um, and abundance of stinging nettle was extremely important. If there's, like I said before, if there's no food for them to eat, then they're not gonna be around. Um, high leaf litter um, to protect them from periods of drought as well as for hibernation. Um, receiving sites. So any um, damp depressions that they can take some um, refuge from the sun and during summer months. And uh, natural openings um, that have increased solar radiation so that we can actually get the stinging nettle in there because stinging nettle does need sunlight in order to grow. So it's kind of a bit of a trade off there. And uh, cool aspects um, and depressions, as I mentioned before. So we're looking mostly at um, away from south-facing slopes. South-facing slopes, they get blasted by the sun all day. We're not going to find much. I don't know if you can see, but so this is all stinging nettle, and it's taller than Serena standing. So you can imagine Ooh. us going through those areas was uh, was fun. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. You essentially, you're, at some point, you kind of got to get a little bit of like a you, resistance. You, resistance to it because you stop feeling it after yeah. a while. I don't know if that's just because you got stung so many times. Or <laughs> the hot tub after help. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, there's the 2021 results. I don't have the 2022 results. The um, report should be out at the end of April, so we can pass that forward when it's finished. Um, but just some of our, yeah, some of the things that we saw. So we did 51 sites in total, and we surveyed a total area of 439,000 square meters in nine days. <laughs> so it's quite a, uh, on hands and knees, crawling, crawling. <laughs> um, and yeah, <laughs> and so we did about uh, 1,930 um, minutes of, of search time. Um, our total number of detections was 271 Oregon forest snail, and our average detection per unit of effort is 0 0.02 snails per minute. Um, the reason why this is actually important is some areas we spent more time in, but, and we, we may have found um, less snails overall. Um, so this is a way of measuring like how, like, how many snails are actually in an area. So we found that mission because it has the, um, it has a 0.1 snail per minute worth of unit effort. Um, uh, they actually had the best population, I guess, or the strongest population of Oregon forest snail, which is pretty interesting. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at that. Do they have a natural predator? Um, shrews would be one of them. Mice, Mice? and rats. Yeah. yeah, that's another one. Um, a lot of birds are running through. Yeah, birds. <laughs> just, they've, got, they've got a lot. They've got a lot going up against them, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is a summary of our results. So 51 locations surveyed, 11 locations with confirmed OFS. Um, and then back to that point that I had highlighted earlier of the 360 meter as their known mm -hmm total height or elevation, um, we actually found snails at 487 meters, mm -hmm. which is 127 meters above their known range. Mm -hmm. um, so, which was an amazing find because that gives us a lot more areas to search in the future um, and a lot more areas that we could potentially protect. So that's, that was really, really great. Um, 271 OFS detected and um, we found that 57% 50 of all the model areas that we surveyed were inaccurately scored. So essentially the model wasn't accurate. Um, so that's where it really becomes important that we actually have to have people on the ground surveying for these guys um, because we just don't have an accurate model to determine if their um, habitat is actually uh, high quality or not. And the, the reason yeah. for that is, um, which I forgot to go into, is the model that was given to us by the government essentially uses something called VRI modeling and TEM mapping, which are, they, they use aerial photography um, to try and map um, the, the forest canopy and determine what kind of species there are just from those photographs. They verify it kind of with, with, with uh, field surveys, but that doesn't happen that often because it's expensive. So. They, they obviously using that method, they can't really look at what understory cover there is. And so they obviously naturally or can't see where the stinging nettle is. So it's a pretty big gap in that kind of modeling. And that modeling is mostly used for forestry. So they're mostly interested. Yeah. They're interested in a completely different thing than what yeah. we're out there doing. So, yeah. um, <laughs> and then in 20... Model show more or less than what your actual survey showed? Like uh, for... The how different many there. So their model. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. For like um, high, moderate, or low, it varied a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, so it's not equal. Then. It wasn't equal, and I can go into more of it in the report, yeah, okay. and I can bring that up later. Um, because it gets a little bit more involved okay. than that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then uh, in 2022, we found or we did 30 survey locations, um, 19 uh, locations with confirmed OFS and 673 OFS detected, which is quite amazing considering um, we did less actual survey locations. So we really dialed in on being able to pinpoint where we know to look for them. So that's pretty cool. 
And then Camille will talk about mapping. <laughs> um, so everything that we talked about is kind of summed up in this one little nice map. Um, these little red dashes um, are our survey locations. Um, obviously some of them are covered by these dots and every single of one of these dots is OFS that we found. Um, it doesn't look like, you know, 50 sites from 2021 and 19 from 2022. That's because in areas like here, um, obviously our, our sites were really close together and that had to do with ease of access and, you know, funding, et cetera, et cetera, a whole bunch of other reasons. Um, and then you can see these little gray bits um, or greenish brown, I guess, whatever color this is, are those locations that were potential survey sites for us. So, and you can see up here, we actually also found OFS um, slightly northeast of their known range as well. So we expanded their range a little bit, which is pretty cool. <laughs> the one you located at the higher elevation, did you follow it on there? Yeah, so that is uh, right here, okay. actually. So, and, and it's important to know, we actually, we actually ran out of time, so we probably could have pushed that elevation a bit more. Um, and, is that the Westwood Plateau there, or no? Um, no, that's an Abbott's Curve. Yeah. Uh, Glen, is it Glen Rider Trail, is that the right? I believe it's, it's right where the, there's a um, gun, range. gun range. Okay. Yeah, yeah. located, yeah. 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 But yeah, we ran out of time, and because we had so such limited time in the field, we didn't think it was, not that it wasn't worth it, but it wasn't the best use of our time to go back, go up this huge mountain, and then look above just to push their elevation of maybe 10, 15 more meters. So if there's ever funding again, we'll definitely be going back there. Um, and this is, this is essentially a map that I put together with where every known occurrence of um, OFS are. So you can see they're pretty scattered around. Um, and this is not including private, obviously, data layers, so from, you know, commercial companies or whatever, like, obviously, everyone, you know, is aware about Trans Mountain, there is, they're essentially everywhere along here, but we can't get that data, unfortunately, so, yeah. Um, and so we had, obviously, a couple of recommendations to Environment Climate Change Canada for this. Um, first one, obviously, because we found them so much higher than what the literature said, um, we recommended that they increase the elevational limit of their, um, uh, of their model. Um, if we can find them at 127 meters above what they're known for, um, their model isn't even taking that into account. So that could open thousands upon thousands of, of acres of land for potential protection in the future. Um, we found that their uh, habitat suitability model incorrectly maps black cottonwood and red alder as high suitability when that's not, that doesn't even, or that's not really um, what habitat these snails uh, thrive in. Um, so that was a recommendation for us, for them to lower that for their model. Um, their ratings should be increased for uh, receiving sites and reduced for steep slopes. Um, we definitely found in the field that the steeper the slope, obviously, um, they are snails, they're pretty good climbers, but the steeper the slope, the less likely you are to find them, and the higher up we went on those steep slopes, we just didn't find any. Um, and receiving sites, more that's just areas that get a lot of precipitation or retain moisture. More moisture, higher chance of OFS being there. And then considering natural openings, so this is actually one of the ones that their modeling could be pretty good to look at since they do that aerial photography. Um, and these areas of high openings, as we said before, are areas where there's a higher chance of there being stinging nettle, which means there's most likely a higher chance for there to be OFS. And also increasing scoring on cool aspects, so on areas that are facing away from the sun during those hot periods of the day. Camille? Yeah. First point, do they have any associations with climate warming? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we unfortunately, like we just didn't have the time or data to be able to say anything, but definitely it could be as things get warmer, they might get pushed to higher elevations. Like how old is the original data in the model? Um, this model is is actually it's brand new. It was like their the the ECC's model was developed like 2019 or something yeah. like that. It's it's really new. It's really new. Yeah. 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 So do your results support the fact that they're red listed? We can't, it's hard to say. Um, they, they don't, we don't, they, there isn't really an estimate for the entire species of how many there actually are. Um, it's just, it's really just noted that um, uh, 
that fragmentation and habitat loss is like the biggest driver um, because these guys aren't actually protected under the Wildlife Act because they're an invertebrate. Wildlife Act only protects vertebrates. So right now, they're only really protected on crown land under the Species at Risk Act by the federal government, but not really with the Wildlife Act. So how would they determine the red list of ice? That's what I don't understand. Like, I mean, has, has this study or this type of study been done before? determine that there's not a lot of them or like what's the norm what? there's been surveys that have been done um from other groups going out yeah. but um it's mostly just that we know that those old growth um, ma big leaf maple forests are declining and that's right. what they need mm -hmm. so if we know that their habitat is getting you know um, fragmented right. then we know that that's like very very likely that their populations are starting to decline so that's how they're determining it Right. I think for the sake of saving time, we'll just keep going with yeah. uh, other ways and answering questions because yeah. we still have another like, 30 slides to go through. Yeah. Um, these, are, oops, these are all the people, well, some of the people that helped us towards the end of the, of the, of the snailing. Um, I won't go through them all. Um, the next is probably the thing people are more excited about is uh, Pacific Water Street because they're cool. Um, I wish I took this photo. No, it's definitely not me. Um, it's such a neat little, little critter. Um, so, Pacific Water Shrew, uh, they are small mammals, obviously, um, average size 13.7 to 17.9 centimeters, they have a 7 centimeter long tail, they're known for, to have this velvety um, brown to black pelage, so the fur on top of them, um, their distinguishing features are that they're fairly unicolored, um, they have another similar species called the Common Water Shrew that is, uh, has a more white underbelly. Um, their tail is also unicolored, um, unlike the, the common water shrew. Um, and they also have these stiff fringe hairs on the outsides of their feet, which helps them swim. Um, oh, I guess, uh, actually, I think I'd go into it later. But um, their conservation status um, under the Species at Risk Act, they're considered endangered. And under um, uh, the, and they're red listed um, under provincial status. So their life cycle, um, so not a lot is known about Pacific Water Shrew because they're small. Um, no one, I, I can't say that no one cares about them, but essentially people care about them a lot less than other animals. Um, and uh, yeah, they're just really hard to find. There's not that many um, uh, known occurrences of them, but this is essentially their general uh, life cycle. So uh, courtship and breeding occurs from sometime in January to end of August. Um, they have litter sizes of three, three to four, or five to seven, um, and even though they're a, they're a very small um, small mammal, they don't seem to hibernate over winter. Um, at least that's the current um, literature. Um, they might go through periods of estivation when there isn't a lot of, or sorry, torpor when there isn't a lot of food. Um, but yeah, again, not too much is known about these guys. Preferred habitat. So this is kind of ideal for them. This is an area where um, there has been a known um, uh, a sighting of them. Please don't ask me where, because I don't remember right now. Uh, <laughs> they, so they prefer lentic habitats. So lentic just means um, still water, essentially, but they, they're also associated with, um, with flowing streams, but uh, not too fast flowing. They're a pretty small animal. They're swimming in a fast stream, they'll get swept away and probably killed. Um, they like uh, mature coniferous forests, um, especially western hemlock, and they're usually only really found within 50 meters of these wet systems. Um, they, uh, they're called the Pacific Water Shrew because they hunt underwater, um, although funny enough, only around 25% of the time. The other 75% of the time, they hunt on land, and they mostly eat insects. <clears throat> So, um, the other component of our project was trying to test out a new, a, a bit of a newer method to try and detect these things. The problem with Pacific Water Shrew is a lot of current methods to figure out if they're in an area involves trapping them in a bucket, um, it's called a pitfall trap, a bucket dug into the ground, um, and you kind of corral them into these areas. But the problem with that is they get really stressed out and they undergo something called um, uh, myopathy, I think it's called, um, where essentially they get so stressed that they just die. And it's a really high mortality rate, so 
it's not really a good way to find a really endangered species if you're killing most of them. <laughs> um, so one thing that we were trying is we were trying to have a, a system where they don't get trapped and that we can still test for them. And that is what this is. So it's a camera trap essentially paired with something called a baited uh, pass-through capture tube. Um, and I'll go into that with it is. And then you perform eDNA on those things. So this, this entire um, methodology was adopted from uh, uh, J. Hobbs Ecological, and these are all the people that worked on it. So, uh, it's a very simple method. One of the biggest things is we have to make it cheap. You can't have super expensive equipment out in the field because you need every consultant, municipality, or whatever to be able to use these things and not pay $10,000 per, per trap. It's just, no one will do that. Um, so, what we tried to do is we essentially got PVC piping, cut them in half, um, and then we got another piece of PVC piping in the middle that you could screw the two ends together, and we essentially put bait inside the center. Um, this PVC piping was, um, uh, we chose it as a particular size um, in order to try and keep out other small rodents like mice, rats, etc. So, we could maximize um, just shrews going in. And we did it this way in the hopes that the shrews would come inside, you know, take a poop, leave some DNA for us, and then leave. Um, each, yeah, super sophisticated, I know. Um, so each of our tubes was baited with um, uh, some of our um, uh, introduced uh, uh, slugs. Um, so this is a chocolate Aryan, and there's two of them mating right here, which is kind of cool. Um, a bit of earthworms, uh, some ground beef, and some peanut butter. And you know, science sacrifices have to be made. Um, but we essentially blended them up, and then we applied one teaspoon into the very center of those two tubes. And yeah. And then came the setup and the deployment. So um, in here, essentially, which kind of tucked behind the rocks, or I think it was maybe over here actually. Um, we would set up a, just a trail camera, which again, we were trying to come up with a way that was cheaper. Um, so trail cameras go for around $200. Um, and so we were trying to uh, pair that baited capture tube with trail cameras um, with lenses on the front to focus in um, the camera to where we wanted it to try and get imagery of these shrews and also hopefully catch some eDNA. And we deployed them, sorry, for three to five day periods. So here's a bunch of photos of some of our setups. So this is uh, Jess Finley. He was responsible essentially for all the camera stuff. Um, he has, just a shout out to him, he has an amazing Instagram and I don't know how he gets some of the photos he gets, it's ridiculous. Um, he's also got like 50,000 followers, so he's pretty good. Um, uh, Anyways, um, so here's for an example of one of our setups. Um, with um, we, So essentially when we went into an area, we would try and find places where we would think uh, water shrew used as trails to go into the water. So they have these known trails um, and they tend to use coarse woody debris um, on the edge of these lentic systems to dive into the water to search for, pred or to, for prey. And so we'd set up these tubes in areas where we thought that would happen. And we, um, uh, again, so you can see another one here, um, and then another one right there, another one right there. And then we would set up our trail cameras, so you can see one there. And as another level of, of confirmation, um, so sorry, this is all the info for our trail cameras. Um, no, I'm not really going to go over it because it's just the setup that we did. If anyone's interested, you can look later. Um, oh, that's too early. Um, uh, so what we also paired this whole system with a really expensive, it's like a $10,000 camera to try and get really HD footage of these shrews. Because as I, as I said before, they have these fringe hairs on the outside of their legs, which are one to two millimeters long. Impossible to see on a trail camera. So we had a really high um, high tech camera set up to try and get really HD photos and just help with the ID. I think there's a slide for it later. Yeah, there is a slide for it later. And we'll show you guys two years of effort. Um, 
Yeah. That's the day I'm going to run Oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Camille, do you remember the diameter for the two? I don't. It's in I the, don't. It's in the, so it we, is. yeah, we, we, um, it, Sorry, this it, was happening before. It just crashes when I Just because it gives a good idea. Of like, yeah, we, we know it, there was a, there was a method to it because if we had it too large, then deer mice would go through and eat all of our bait. Mm -hmm. So it was, there was a, there was so it must a. must be quite that. Must be quite small. Yeah, it was very small. Yeah, yeah, it's quite, it's quite small. Um, but yeah, it's in between a, a mouse size and then just like a, a small, like a very small shrew size. So it's yeah, so like somewhere in between. Yeah. Well, they're they're, they're, all, they're like this, this big. Uh, yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Oh, feels right there. Oh, we've got yeah. Yeah. We'll get into that whole yeah, we'll game later. <laughs> um, so I'll play this video again. We have a couple videos. And then you can see him poke up the end there. <laughs> Yeah, so you can see they're quite quick and quite small, so they're not easy to find. And actually, I'll play it one more time. And you can see back here, where my mouse is, is that it actually, right past that point, was where the, um, uh, the swamp was, and it dove into the water mm -hmm. straight after that, which is really neat. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's in real time? Yeah, yeah. these are real time. Yeah. They're, really, they're fast. really fast. Very, very fast. Yeah. I think that's the same one. Sorry. So you can see that not all of our footage was great, because sometimes they would just kind of show up and then leave. <laughs> that one. And I'll show one more. Yeah, and sometimes, yeah, they would go into our tube, but other times they would just avoid it completely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that's two years. Yeah, two, two years, years for. How much do you even know that one was specific water? So this is where we, this is how the, the eDNA kind of comes into it because we can't tell. 100, the hundred percent certainty if it's actually a water shrew or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, of uh, we would use the maybe you want to talk about this a little bit more. Yeah. I'm kind of stepping on your thing, but um, essentially we would use this to confirm the videos to confirm. Oh, hey, we got a shrew, and then we're like, okay, because eDNA testing is super expensive. So based on that, then we would go and swab those tubes and then send it in for eDNA analysis. So mm -hmm. that's kind of. Yeah. Yeah. The reasoning for that. Which, which, yeah, I'll go into that. But so this yeah. is this is our other setup, essentially the super expensive, very HD camera. This is all of the settings that we used. Um, that's for you, Paul. If you ever want to do this. <laughs> um, uh, but essentially, yeah, we set it up quite close. It was paired with an infrared camera. Um, something's clearly going to explode. Um, and so it was paired with an infrared camera um, that was trying to detect the motion of these shrews. Um, That's coming crazy, guys. Just got it. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, and so this is an example of a deer mouse of how good this camera can be. So you can zoom in, and you wow. would be able to see wow. the um, yeah the fringe hairs of the shrews wow. if we ended up getting any footage of shrews with this camera, which we didn't, unfortunately. unfortunately. Yeah. So, like, turns out. Ten, fifteen thousand dollar cameras are really hard and really finicky. So, <laughs> yeah, this was the best footage we could get, and it was of a deer mouse, but still pretty cute. So, onto the eDNA. So, obviously, once we um, once we confirmed there was a shrew coming through our tube, we would take those tubes, and then we would essentially put finger cots on our fingers, um, wet them with seventy percent isopropyl alcohol rub the inside of that tube in the hopes that they left any kind of DNA. Um, we would put all of that into Ziploc containers and we'd send it to um, UVic. Uh, UVic, University of Victoria. Um, they were thankful enough to do that pro bono because eDNA analysis is also quite expensive. Um, and we just didn't have the funding for that. So that was really nice of them. And I realized we forgot to put that in our, our acknowledgements. Please don't hate us. Uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, so this is essentially the, the, the methods that we went through. I won't go through it all, but if anyone's interested, it's on here. And so our, our results, um, don't pay attention to this for now. Um, unfortunately, 
we could not confirm that any of our shrews were a Pacific water shrew. They, whether they just didn't leave any DNA in our tubes, um, it's just, it was super unfortunate. I can't remember how many samples we did, but we did quite a few eDNA samples and we just could not confirm it. It all came back inconclusive in both years. Um, in 2022, we expanded the amount of areas that we went to and we were just, we were picking areas that we knew there were Pacific water shrew. And as you saw, we got what's most likely Pacific water shrew on camera. We just can't confirm it, unfortunately, with DNA. But the funny thing that happened is that in 2022, um, we had a shrew show up at our doorstep, um, dead. <laughs> and our uh, house backs out onto Kanaka Creek. So. <laughs> yeah, so where there's no known Pacific water shrew, but it is within their range and their elevation. So there's a chance this is a Pacific water shrew that decided to show up on our front doorstep, quite literally. <laughs> so we sent it off to, to get your DNA on it, but we haven't heard back yet. You want to die? No, it just walked and died. It just yeah. decided to. It was weird. It was, it was the most random thing. <laughs> um, and yeah, so these are all the people that worked on the project. Um, I might be missing one or two. As you can see, quite a few people were part of this, and there were also people behind the scenes that helped with administrative and whatnot. So it's no, it wasn't a small effort. Um, it was a lot of work. Um, and once again, uh, thank you to all of our funders and. It's in white here, but University of Victoria, I swear, is right there. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, that was a really long presentation. Yeah, it was a long.